The only thing we can be sure of about the future is that it will be absolutely fantastic. Five, four, three, two, one. today it's a great pleasure to be with you thank you so much for coming to meet me at uh, we're at the campus of the beautiful Loyola Marymount University located in the uh, in the travel district of Los Angeles mm -hmm. not far from LAX convenient uh, to all major freeways <clears throat> and uh, it's a great pleasure to interview you I've, I've had the pleasure of reading your books for many years I think you've autographed every copy I've had except for the most recent <laughs> copy because uh, that I read an audiobook or listened to an audiobook do you have an opinion on audiobooks? Do you think you get as much out of an audiobook? Do you get more out of an audiobook? I think you've read it. This, this one you you read get it. things out of an audiobook. You might not get the same things. I get, uh, interestingly, there's a bunch of people who have written in to say that they get both. You know, they get the audiobook. Do, yeah. And mm -hmm. then they, if it's, because my books tend to involve, you know, complicated things, mm -hmm. right? You know, mind stretchy things. And they want to go back yeah. to certain parts of the book and get it. So get both. Get both. That's the advice. Get all three. Kindle. Hard copy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I know a lot of people. Just for yourself. A lot of people like the to read the, play, we call that. the Lagrangian at the end. That's uh, the big picture. <laughs> that was a standout. Uh, th this one, this latest book, your latest opus, I thought your, your previous book might be, you know, used up all the words you could possibly use in your vast brain. But this one, uh, even, even more, I think, deeply, uh, truly does uh, involve new ideas, new theories, new new kind of modes of thinking about reality and the universe. And although, you know, I remember when you mentioned it on Twitter, you're going to write a new book in the coming years. It was a couple of years ago. Um, <clears throat> and you said, you know, this book's going to be at quantum mechanics and it's going to solve everybody's problems. I'm sure everybody's going to understand, understand quantum mechanics. <laughs> after reading this. Yes. And certainly we come away with a much better uh, understanding of quantum mechanics. But I think the book is, is deeply misleading because it's really about gravity. And I felt that it was uh, a very, very uh, interesting and beautiful turn of events that only sort of partway through the book, after the, you know, the requisite explanation of how, um, how quantum mechanics is, has been interpreted and could be interpreted, that you turn to a much more kind of exciting frontier, at least for physicists like myself and my colleagues. Uh, of course, it's a popular book, but, but really... Uh, did you set? Is this the book you set out intending to write two years ago when you made that famous momentous tweet? You know, I uh, the book has a very natural structure into three different parts. The first part is explaining quantum mechanics, the basics of it, and including a little light introduction to many worlds. And then the second part is a deep dive into many worlds: what it means, why it's difficult, what the alternatives are, etc. And the third part is, as you said, an exploration of gravity and the emergence of space time, and an argument that. One of the things holding us back from quantizing gravity is that we don't understand quantum mechanics very well. And in particular, the thinking about things in the many worlds way helps us quantize gravity. So I actually bounced back and forth when, when conceptualizing a book and when writing it. Should it be just about many worlds or should it be many worlds building up to this particular view of quantum gravity? And, you know, literally with a very short period of time, actually literally after I had written the first draft of part three, mm -hmm. I said, let's take it out. Let's just, let's just stick with just many worlds because it's a, uh, it's a nice compact complete uh, story just mm -hmm. by that. It's a smaller book, more easily digestible. Yeah. Right. And uh, my editor said, you know, that he really liked the idea that we could show it as inaction in modern physics at research level stuff. You know, he said, it's, it's nice, but when all of your dates are 1960 or before, that's not as much fun as when some of the dates mentioned are 2016 and 2017 and 2018. Right. And, yeah, reference to modern results. But I think, yeah, really coming up with... Um, with a way to hook the reader's natural curiosity about quantum mechanics. And there have been a plethora of books, no short, no short books, books, yes, as you mechanics. point out, which is unusual because, you know, that's for something that's not well understood, and I'm not going to use the famous line by the man who hold, you are now hold his desk, yeah. uh, Richard Feynman at Caltech, you have the Feynman desk. Some professors are chaired, some are desks, um, yeah. and some are, yeah. but, uh, but in this case, you know, I think with, with all these books, and, and, as you said in your famous, you know, I'm sure everyone's going to understand my version of it. Uh, <laughs> this is really the first one. I mean, there have been other books, but they, they tend to kind of uh, have a concomitant description of the multiverse, and, and you get into it. Uh, but specifically with regard to Everettian uh, theory, this is, you know, one of the more, 
kind of notable ones that goes into the actual meat and you know, potatoes of that of that theory. As I said before, we sat down. I don't I don't like podcasts where you know the the host interviews the author. So tell us, you know, what is a reader going to get out of your book? Because it means that a <laughs> the host did not read the book. Uh, right. B, he's, uh, he or she is trying to undermine your sales, and uh, you know, you know, I know you that through the cat, the cat food budget. Um, although I want to point out that uh, this is the first time I think in, in, in human history. In your last book, you quoted Bill and Ted, and that was excellent. No pun intended. <laughs> uh, in this book, you found a way actually to save Schrodinger's cat from ultimate annihilation. I no was, cats were harmed. Harmed in any public experience. Hence the PETA endorsement on the back of the book. Um, so I want to I want to get a little bit um, uh, outside the, the realm. But let me just you know, yeah, on, the, on that note of what you just said, you know, mm-hmm. I, I, there are many books on the cats, and not every single one of them, but the vast majority have the philosophy that isn't this weird? We'll never <laughs> understand it. It's a mystery, right? And I, whether or not you believe many worlds, I wanted to undo that particular thing. That's why I did think that another book mechanics was something that had a place in the world because i want to say number one it's not ineffably mysterious it's just science right and number two here's a possible way to make sense of it now you might not believe my possible way to make sense of it but it can be made sense of and that's the more important message yeah yeah i i was questioning you know whether or not if i were in your position would i advocate that a young you know, a science, popular science author, write a book about the foundations of quantum mechanics, you know, as a, as a means to, you know, fund and profit. I'm not sure I would. And in the book, you point out the fact that nobody writes books about the interpretations of classical mechanics. I mean, they're not, you've, you've touched very deeply on interpretations of statistical mechanics and the origin of the era of time. And in your previous books, the origin of Higgs boson, the particle of the universe, um, etc. But um, but I think it's unusual because in our classes we, we never sit down. We kind of get pulled a fast one. If you're a physics grad student or even an undergraduate, you don't need to know the foundations of Newtonian mechanics, as you point out. Baseball's going to travel. It involves some baseballs travel, uh, and it's actually true that you probably should spend some time on the, on the interpretations of quantum mechanics, the foundations of quantum mechanics. But we never do. We never teach it to our students that way. Um, so I found this useful, uh, you know, to for the professionals in the audience that this is actually a useful tool for even you know advanced or you know, first year graduate students that are curious about quantum information, uh, cubism, things like that, but also to understand what they're doing because there's a Merman quote that you use often: "Shut up and calculate." Um, which he was not saying. No, I know he was. He just, just said and calculate. Right. Saying. I think uh, that's right. Yeah, that was sort of the intro. And I actually have the distinction of being told by none other than. 2019 Nobel Prize laureate Jim Peebles uh, to shut up and measure when I started asking him too many <laughs> questions. He, that he's the ultimate gentleman, yes, uh, of course. So he laughed at the colloquium and told me to shut up and measure the CMV. And um, that's what we're trying to do. And I think what's so interesting about, about this book and the connections that you make within it <clears throat> is, is this connection between the small things in the universe, the ultimate quantum things, uh, and the larger things, the universe, which we study. And, you know, to first order, it might be curious for the listener to hear why they should be related at all. I mean, why should the very smallest things be related to the very biggest things? That's maybe question, you know, one, part one of a question. And part two is how can, you know, space time itself, the framework in which Newtonian mechanics is played out upon, how can that emerge from quantum mechanics? Yeah. Uh, and I think that's, that's a key you know, philosophical point you make in the book. And I think it's, um, I think it'll be interesting to hear your thoughts on that. How, how do we, how do we get around this, this notion that this very small things have almost no that We don't have to influence ants in this basement and, uh, on, the, on the biggest parts of, of, of the universe. So yeah, what, what do you, what, to what do you attribute this fascinating connection between the ultra small, maybe plant scale structure of space time and the grandness of the cosmos that we see today? Yeah. I mean, I would say that, Quantum mechanics is not a theory of the very small. I think that sometimes we say that. I've said that. Everyone mm-hmm. says that. But a more precise version of that statement is quantum mechanics becomes necessary when you think about the very small. When you think about the very large, when you get a rocket to the moon, you don't need quantum mechanics. Right. You just do Newtonian gravity. You need general relativity to get a rocket to the moon. Uh, so quantum mechanics is a theory that has a limit, which we call classical mechanics, right? In certain circumstances, under certain conditions when things obey certain parameters, then classical mechanics is a very, very good approximation. But that's the puzzle, right? I mean, the puzzle isn't why we need quantum mechanics for the very small. The puzzle is why classical mechanics works at all, because classical mechanics is so different than quantum mechanics in a fundamental way. 
Uh, and this, I mean, part of the reason why I wrote the book is this is what I'm doing research on right, right now. Like, why is there a classical limit and where does it come from? And what you see when you do look at the literature on this is everyone cheats. Everyone knows the world is classical, so they just find the classical mechanics in there, but they don't show why it was necessary or how it could have been the other way. They take certain features of the world for granted, like the existence of space, right? Like three-dimensional space, up, down, left, right, forward, backward. They just put that in, right? And as, as you know, as a physicist, when you learn physics and you want to learn, okay, learning quantum mechanics, let's start with a harmonic oscillator. What do you do? They teach you the classical harmonic oscillator and there's a process called quantizing right quantization and again nature doesn't do that nature doesn't start with some classical world and quantize it and my strong conviction is that that's why we haven't quantized gravity because we stubbornly insist on starting with a classical theory whether it's general relativity or string theory or anything else and quantizing it and i think that if we just start with a quantum theory the real purely quantum theory from the start without assuming any classical superstructure, we might be able to show how gravity emerges from it. But guess what? That's really hard. Yeah. Like, it's not at all clear how to make progress doing that. Well, one thing that is seemingly clear, but even there I'm going to hesitate, is the laws of physics need to be pretty special to get the classical emerge, uh, world emerging at all. So why or do the laws of physics have that property? I really don't know. I would like to know that. You know, in my more speculative moments, I wonder, like, is there, if you had a random, generic, truly unstructured set of laws of physics, could it somehow break up into different sectors, all of which had classical limits or something like that? But I don't really see how that could happen. So. Yeah, it seems like, you know, this consistent, you know, fool's errand, which is, which is, you know, to find gravity and have it uh, be quantized. But uh, to do it the other way around uh, seems profitable. And, of course, you explore that in the third part of the book. Uh, and I think that is a unique, you know, not too often do, to my knowledge, I haven't seen that explored before. So to, to propose, you know, new, new modalities of thinking, I think, is, is very commendable. Uh, I mean, let's yeah. mention for the people who are not experts yeah. out there. You know, one of the things we talk about in classical mechanics is position and momentum, position and velocity. Like momentum, classically, is just the velocity times the mass of a particle. And that, in Newtonian physics, that's the state of a particle. You need a position, you need momentum, I can tell you what it's going to do. But clearly they're not on an equal footing, right? Like the way that we teach it, the way we conceptualize it, position comes first, and momentum seems to be derived from that. But then you go to this more advanced supercharged version of classical mechanics called Hamiltonian mechanics, and the distinction becomes a little blurry, right? Like position and momentum now seem to be more equal. And in quantum mechanics, in the formalism of quantum mechanics, they're completely equal. You know, there's an operator P for momentum, there's an operator Q for position. One might ask why those are letters, but okay, they're the letters. Right. And they all the equations they appear in, they appear in symmetric. And that really sort of begins to poke at you and say, why is it like that? Why is there a difference between position and momentum? So I, I have a chapter in the book about that, and right. I'm sure there's no other books that have chapters. No, on that that's question. right. <laughs> <laughs> For all, all you aspiring quantum mechanics, that's popular science. And, and I, I think, you know, even in my popular books, I want to say something substantive. I, I don't want to just say, here's the stuff we've discovered and present it pedagogically. That's part of it. But I also want to make an argument that people can potentially disagree with. That's yeah, one I mean, of my goals. I think also the fact that there's a, there's a frontier. It's not a dead subject. Yeah. It's not for you know, people that lived 100 years ago. You know, I mean, it's been said by people, I think you know, David Gross might have said, well, you know, we need interpretations of, of you know, or, or maybe he said something like this, you know, particles need particle physis physicists the same way that birds need ornithologists, you know. And that, I think Feynman gets you know, it something like that. He, yeah. Yes, that's right. So in this case, I mean, do we need it? I mean, as you said, classical, Poisson brackets, Lagrangian theory, uh, and then promoting it with, with quantum commutation relations. That's about all you get in Sakurai, uh, or the you know, classical text for those of you non-experts out there that we use in first-year graduate student classes. But, um, but nowhere in there does it say, well, there's a whole you know, panoply of different ways you could interpret what is is fundamental and what is the actual entity uh, under which you know reality is to be ascribed and I, and I wonder you know in the many worlds interpretation which obviously you're an advocate of you've been an outspoken proponent of uh, you, uh, you mentioned many times in the book how it's not only appealing to physicists but it's also made its way into popular culture and, and films yeah. and, and, and so forth um, and uh, you know to, to what do you attribute this sort of 
very dominant kind of, I, I have to be honest with you, I'm almost, almost like bias against the ever ready and many worlds interpretation, favor of the standard, which every physicist in almost every book you have read and I have read will say, we know this isn't right. Here's all the rules. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, uh, of course, most physicists, if you ask them about their favorite interpretation on mechanics, they would just say they don't care. Right, they like, don't even want to think about that. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that's bizarre <laughs> and weird. I mean, I've had professional physicists tell me, I don't care what actually happens in reality. All I care is what the measurement outcomes or the observational predictions. I don't think that any 12 year old gets excited by science by saying, someday I'm going to make some observational predictions. <laughs> so, like, I don't care what happens in reality. I think that you get excited because you're actually curious about the real world and what happens. And somehow we managed to beat that out of our students. So there's this thing called the Copenhagen interpretation, which you know traces back probably to Heisenberg or anyone else. And no one ever explicitly says what it is, and it's kind of very fuzzy. But it has this, it follows this idea that what we're supposed to do is just make predictions, not ask what's happening underneath the hood. And if you believe in the real world and there's something happening underneath the hood, I want to know what that is. So I don't, I don't think we should be satisfied with that. And I think that we should let our students not be satisfied with it. Right. And, yeah, we always have this image uh, of, of the old ones, you know, go into this field once their product, productive career. Yeah. Has once they're done with serious work. Right, yeah. As, as you point out, you know, Einstein, when he was uh, thinking about uh, spooky action at a distance and EPR paradox was uh, at the ripe old age of, of 48, which is, me, yeah. which is my <laughs> age right now. So I feel, you know, I should have a more, you know, kind of respectable beard and mu our mustache and, and hairstyle. Um, I want to talk about, uh, you know, some of the criticisms that the many world theory does have. But before we do that, because I think that's standard podcast, but we probably haven't asked that one. Maybe. I want to know more about you and what excites you, what fascinates you about life. I, I know that you, you know, are a very cultured man and you're a very uh, erudite man. Obviously, you, your, your interests are, are highly peripatetic. They range from theology to deep in the heart of astrophysics, cosmology, fundamental physics. But I also know that you're, you're an ordinary person. You, you are man. fascinated by many different things. Put I know my pants one leg at a time. One leg at a like time. <laughs> <laughs> I've done it twice with two legs, but then I'll talk about that. Um, I know you're interested in time. I know that you are an avid, yeah. uh, have an avid fascination with watches because I once watched you uh, at an auction putting a thousand dollar bid in a G Shock. I found that very unusual, <laughs> but uh, to each is our own. So I know that you're, that. you're, you're, you're <laughs> this is in a different world. I do own a G Shock. Yeah, I, I, you guys do I. I own a couple of them because they're not, you know, you have a bunch something. of little kids around there. Um, but uh, to, uh, outside physics, what is Sean Carroll up to? What, what, what kind of things do you do that make time pass by without your noticing it? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm lucky enough that there are things that I do that other people might think are work, that I think are fun. Like I have my own podcast, yes. right? Called Mindscape. Mindscape. Yes. And I write books. And, you know, I, it's, it's interesting when you write books because I know many professional science writers. And that's what they do for a living, is write. <laughs> yeah. But they, they write articles for magazines or websites or whatever, and many of them hate writing books. Yeah. And I hate writing articles, but I love writing books because yeah. I'm like, give me 100,000 words to you know, <laughs> set people straight, and that's really what I want. <laughs> right? And, uh, and you know, one of the reasons why I started the podcast is because I love reading other people's books, but it's very hard to find the time, yeah. right? I had a long, big stack of books, and yeah. I'm like, I'm never going to read these. <laughs> but if I need to interview the author, then maybe I'll at least skim through Hence, it. you're here today, and I said, right. your book. And that's why, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's why uh, the podcast is very eclectic. I, I'm not like a thrill seeker in terms of, you know, skydiving or rock climbing, like many of our friends are. I like uh, eating good food, drinking good wine. Uh, just got back from our annual vacation in Las Vegas where we eat an enormous amount of food. <laughs> and I play poker, right? Yeah. Which is another kind of thing that is not surprising to hear physicists yeah. playing poker. Right? Yeah, the basis know, theorem sure. comes up that's know, right. very, very often. But uh, yeah, that's what I like to do, you know, read, write, talk to people, mm -hmm. drink good food and wine. That's my life. What about uh, speaking and, and kind of uh, the classical speaking versus debating versus being on podcasts? Mm -hmm. I think some people, you know, shy away from them. They don't like they're right. more comfortable behind a computer screen or right. notepad. Um, where do you fall on that spectrum? Yeah, you know, I uh, was, as a kid, one of these people who thought, you know, debating was really fun. I joined the debate team, was on the speech team in high school, mm -hmm. and um, I was terrible. 
Like I, I, in fact, like over and over again, I get the same comment that, you know, what you're saying is somewhat interesting, but your delivery is sucks. It's just, you can't give a talk to save your life. And, uh, you know, I worked at it and I, I, uh, there was like a little phase transition. You know, there's a moment I can pinpoint in my senior year in high school where I sort of became a good public speaker. And, but, and I, I loved being on the debate team because it did help teach you logic and argumentation and, and speech and so forth. But I actually don't like debating as such mm -hmm. anymore. I mean, I think that. You have had some notable debates with people like William. I've Craig done it. People I've that are done it. Vehemently, uh, you know, respectful, but. Yeah, but on the other side. Yeah, yeah, I did one on life after death, for example. Um, and, uh, yeah, and, you know, I do think that it serves a purpose. But, you know, people on Twitter, for example, are like, debate me. Like, oh, really? <laughs> well, I think that Twitter's just, I love Twitter as a medium, but not for discussion. Yeah. It's just for points. It's pure. Yeah. But, you know, debating, um, it's, a, it's a performative act. You know, I'm happy to debate with someone like William Lane Craig or uh, the Stephen Alexander, who I debate on Life After Death with, but not because we are advancing human knowledge, but because we're sharing some existing human knowledge with the audience, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think that if you actually, you know, there's, there's a different thing you do if you have two people with the same goals of understanding the world. They don't debate. They sit down and talk, right? They discuss, right? Mm -hmm. And that's much more like what I do on the podcast, right? Like even when I have people on the podcast who I disagree with, um, my goal is to let them have their say and maybe, you know, note my reasons for not believing them, but then move on. Like mm -hmm. I'm not there to show why they're wrong or anything like that. That just is my interest. Right. Mm -hmm. And a similar kind of canard leveled against uh, science authors, popular science authors, is that it's not really something a serious scientist does. And, you know, I got some criticism along those lines in, in my book, which you were kind enough to blurb with the, with the phrase readable, which I thought was, you know, a little overselling it. It was readable. But no, I think you, you were much more effusive in your praise, and I'm very uh, grateful that you were, were so. But, um, you know, kind of you get comments that, oh, well, you know, you, you're you spending your time writing books, and I'm in the laboratory during this oh, yeah. or you, I'm in the, you know, in the, in the throes of the calculation. So how do you react to that? How do you have the day job and the night job? And what do you view as the as the responsibility or maybe lack thereof of a professional scientist in terms of communicating. I think it's not just scientists, I think academics more generally sure. have this weird point of view that says, oh, you are spending your time making what we do for a living accessible and interesting to outsiders. Therefore, you are trash. <laughs> <laughs> right. You are helping taxpayers fund me. Therefore, I sustain you. Right? Yeah. Although they want to overtly say that, but that's sort of well, that's, that's right. the functional end of their criticism. I think that's exactly right. They won't overtly yeah. say it. Well, but then when you say, right. well, what they'll say is we love popularization or outreach or things like that. And then you say, okay, but this person who does it, they're like, yeah, they're not that. It's not serious. Right. He, he or she can make it. So it could real they, uh, they should really spend the time doing research. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, what can I say? I, I spend my, my, my response to that is to not care. Yeah. Like, you know, just to do, you know, um, it has hurt my career in various ways. It has helped my career in various other ways. So what can I say? It's what I want to do. So right. as long as I can do it, I'm going to do it and they can live with it. Right, and it brings you joy, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think that's that is. Important. And but you also mentioned about the responsibility aspect. I mean, I would be not completely honest if I said that I did this out of some sense of duty or obligation. Mm -hmm. I like it. I yeah. do enjoy it, and I enjoy even if no one read it. I like the writing. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I, I really do enjoy that sort of puzzle solving of getting the pieces together. And you learn things. You realize you understand things much mm -hmm. better when you've written a book about that. Um, I think I don't think that individual scientists have any responsibility to talk to the general public. I think the field has a responsibility. There's many scientists who I think would be terrible talking to the general public. They should say <laughs> and deeply that's hidden. Fine. Yes, they should say deeply hidden. That, that's perfectly <laughs> fine. But I think that as a field, you know, we rely on the public, and especially the kind of stuff that you and I do, which is not going to cure cancer, right? right. We're really in it for curiosity, for research, understanding how the world works, and if the world, the taxpayers and citizenry and the polity, comes up with money to pay for you to discover things about reality, mm -hmm. and then you don't tell them right. what you discovered. Like, what is the point of that? Yeah, my late colleague uh, Hans Parr at UC San Diego used to tell me, you know, we, we serve at the pleasure of politicians who currently aren't 
engaged in any serious war that requires physicists or astronomers to engage their mental capacities into, right? Um, and that Neil deGrasse Tyson's written about that, the partnership between alliance between astronomy and, and, and big uh, military industrial campaigns. Um, I want to talk a little bit just about um, kind of the places that your mind has taken you. And I think a lot of, a lot of as I see you, in the role of a popular science writer, is all of that's a, you know, one of your many uh, abilities, but also as a teacher. And I know that your teaching is very important to you at Caltech and your, in your kind of day job, so to speak, although I think you probably do it at night or you, you write during the day or at Feynman's desk. Um, but uh, in terms of that axis of pleasure and, and obligation, I mean, where does teaching fall? Is it something that one, one thing we're concerned about at the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination is, can you teach imagination? Can you teach creativity? And as you know, and as I know, and many of our, our colleagues know, science is eminently creative. And I think to think of it as this purely analytic and, and quantitative um, aspect of human you know, nature is not respecting its role as a part of culture. I think yeah. science is culture. Um, and yet, you know, some people, there, there is sort of a, uh, a distinction between whether creativity, like, you know, brilliance can that be taught and then what where do you fall in that kind of axis well i think you know something i've come to appreciate that there was a weird thing that he said to me the very first time i taught my own course which is when i was a postdoc actually mm -hmm. uh one of the professors at mit where i was a postdoc who was scheduled to teach general relativity went on sabbatical and never came back <laughs> so they were stuck without anyone teaching the course so uh they asked me as a postdoc to teach general relativity and for better or for worse i said yes and that ended up turning into lecture notes, which ended up turning into a book. Right. So it affected uh, me and the world that way. But at the time, I was living, you know, poor postdoc, living in someone's house. And uh, I was living in the top floor of a house owned by this couple who were both psychologists. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the guy learns that I'm going to be teaching. And he was a professor himself of, of psychology. And he said, you know, whatever the subject matter that you're teaching, what your students will actually take away from you, most importantly, is your moral example. Hmm. And I'm like, maybe that's true when you're teaching you psychology. Yeah, exactly. I'm teaching general relativity. Right. What they're going to take away from me are the symmetries of the Riemann tensor, right? <laughs> yeah. um, but years later, I realized he was right. And maybe moral example isn't how a scientist would say it, but I don't know if you can teach uh, brilliance or creativity or imagination, but what you can do is show it, right? Uh, I don't know how to articulate how to be a good scientist but I can be an example of a good scientist. The way that you teach, what, are you willing to say, I don't know? Are you willing to do things in real time? Uh, how careful are you about doing different things? How interested are you in explaining why things are one way rather than the other way? How much do you care about how the students are doing, et cetera? All of that is at least probably much more important than the actual subject matter, which after all, they can get from the book. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I've kind of noticed throughout the questions to, to many different experts, you know, from Pulitzer Prize winning poets to Nobel Prize winning physicists, that there is sort of a, a notion uh, that you can, you can teach, you can teach certainly well, and you can inspire, but, you know, potentially creativity has to be some, something else, something else that's, that's perhaps emergent once they're exposed to these things. You know, it might be like some of my artist friends say, when I meet a young person who wants to be an artist, I say, go and paint the masters, you know, first do that, first yeah. understand where it can, who are the masters in our discipline? Learn the rules and then break. Them. Yeah, that's exactly right. So I think that that's uh, that is that is kind of maybe holds true across this aspect of, of culture. And that same uh, dear colleague of mine who passed away unfortunately last year, Hans Barr, used to say that general relativity was the uh, you know crowning accomplishment of Western civilization. Now I'll just leave that there. Um, I want to add one other thing to what you said a few minutes ago when we we're talking about taxpayers and so forth. <clears throat> Science, you know, quantum mechanics, uh, I would say, and astronomy in my case, is, is something that's a apolitical, or it should be. I would say, you know, there's no Republican constellation over there, a Democrat comet over, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it should be. And yet we see nowadays people wading into politics, and, and I think um, sometimes I think there's a little bit too much of the halo effect. This person, Albert Einstein, was very smart. He understood the speed of light, so let's ask him about, you know, what, what, what should there be in terms of how many nations should there be on Earth? Um, I know that you have multiple online personalities, not in a bad way, not your psychologist ones, but <laughs> you have a political Sean Carroll account. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, do you believe there is an obligation for scientists to be political? And, and if so, is there some sort of scientific, you know, um, 
litmus test or, or whatever that <clears throat> you know an authentic scientist should hold, or do you believe that you can have you know sort of a full spectrum? Of, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, it's a little bit of an exaggeration to say that science is not political. The universe, is yeah, political. Right. the universe does what it does, whatever our, our political right. beliefs are. The Earth but it. science is a human activity. <laughs> That is embedded in politics and, and psychology and, and uh, hopes and dreams and loves and fears, just like everything else, right? And, and admitting that, I think, is important. Um, I think that there's no necessary connection between one's science and one's politics. I don't think that there's any responsibility on the part of individual scientists to get involved in politics. I don't think that being a scientist gets you any special expertise points when it comes to politics. But I also don't think that you should shut up about politics just because you're a scientist. Sure. Yeah, no one and I think that you know, when <clears throat> I completely agree that you know someone's a famous scientist, they're expounding on politics. That doesn't. There's no reason why the public should spend that much time listening to them, even if they're Albert Einstein. Mm -hmm. um, likewise, if they're a movie star or a singer expounding about politics, and yet they do, right. but. I kind of blame the audience for this, yeah. right? Like, let the movie star expound all they want. I'm right. not, not going to blame them for expounding. Right. But if CNN wants to report on their, uh, ex, ex, what is the noun form of an expounding? Um, uh, Exposing. <laughs> I don't know, yeah. Uh, Expostulation. Expostulations. Expostulations. Uh, <clears throat> and that's just crazy. Mm -hmm. Like, why should CNN do that? Um, and yet you see it quite frequently. Oh, there are so yeah. many no milk prize yeah. winners that are in favor of this treaty or should vote for that. And there candidate. is, you know, there is sometimes there's a, there is a, an overlap, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, climate change is obviously a place sure. for uh, arms control, might be a place where there's an overlap between scientific expertise and political expertise. Mm -hmm. And again, I think that scientists should be outspoken about politics if that's what they want to do, but they should be judged in how sensible their statements about politics are, not mm -hmm. because they have a PhD in a topic. Business. Right. <laughs> That's right. Any more so, you know, people ask me to give a talk uh, about cosmology, and then at the end, it's inevitable someone asks about climate change. And mm -hmm. I always say, you know, I hope when you have a talk about climate change, and someone asks them about cosmology, they say, you know, you should consult a, a real practicing well, cosmo cosmology. Cosmos, like Buck Holt and uh, Bill Foster, yeah, right, uh, who are physicists who politics. shifted into politics mm -hmm. very well with that. So I mean, there's no incompatibility there, but there's no necessary connection. Mm -hmm. So we talked a little bit about what you do outside of physics and uh, outside of the, the lab and, and writing. I want to get back into the book in, in just a bit. Um, I do want to talk just you know, more broadly speaking about your, as we say in the biz, uh, world line. You know, how you got to you know, here today, not maybe not here. Yeah. The four of ways, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's right. Which is more complicated than all of the cosmology and quantum mechanics. But um, can you explain for the listeners who might not be familiar with your unique path to becoming a, a theist, a atheist? Sorry, I should say, and a, <laughs> or a naturalist, as you say. Um, uh, for one example, and being a physicist, I don't uh, I believe that you weren't originally intending to be a physicist when you started off in college and doing all that stuff. If I recall correctly, perhaps I'm wrong, but but you had other intentions. No, I definitely wanted to be a physicist. Oh, yeah, okay. I, I was one of these lucky kids who decided when they were 10 years old what oh, wow. they wanted to do. So I was reading books about the Big Bang and black holes. Mm -hmm. My favorite book was a completely unknown book simply entitled High Energy Physics. Mm -hmm. It talked about all these particles being created with the Bevatron mm -hmm. in the 60s. So I was reading this in the mid late 70s. And uh, I wanted to do that. I had no idea what that meant to do. That and I even quickly figured out I wanted to be a theorist, I wanted to be a theoretical physicist, and right? So like lab, no one, yeah, like no one wanted <laughs> wanted me in the lab. Like wow, I had a chemistry I, set. I kept you out of the lab when you visited. It's surprising that I, yes, you know, I kept all my toes and fingers. I kept the chemistry the set that I had. <laughs> um, but you know, we I was from I think a long line of steel workers. I went to public school. No one in my family had any idea this involved. Mm -hmm. uh, so I got a full tuition scholarship to go to Villanova. So I said yes, because yes. it was free. So that was nice. And they had a very good astronomy department at Villanova. Physics probably mm -hmm. not that great, but good enough that I could just do research. And you know, I got published papers out of my undergraduate research in astronomy. But I also got introduced to a lot of interesting topics in politics and philosophy and literature and things like that. So I became a philosophy minor. Mm -hmm. um, that became very interesting to me. And because of Former Villanova alumnus uh, was a, a research scientist at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. I got rejected by the Harvard Astronomy well, Physics Department, but the Harvard Astronomy Department took me. So <laughs> that's why I stayed an astronomer, even though I'm not an astronomer. Like you know, I'm not an astronomer. <laughs> yes, right. People out there like are confused by this constellations are not, not an astronomer. Right? <laughs> I, I've collected data. I've collected like that's right. You know? Yes. 
Um, so I was in the astronomy department, but again, I got lucky enough to be matched with George Field as my advisor. And at the time, I mean, George is a super famous expert in the interstellar medium and galactic physics and things like that, like needle hydrodynamics, again, things like that. I don't do for a living, mm -hmm. but he'd become curious about particle physics and cosmology. And so we wrote papers together and we learned together. Mm -hmm. And then I got lucky again because people at MIT, Eddie Party and Alan Poof, uh, found me and asked me to work with them mm -hmm. on general relativity and things like that, then hired me as a postdoc. Oh, at MIT, awesome. I went to the Institute of Theoretical Physics in Santa Barbara, mm -hmm. um, met a lot of brilliant people like Billy Dobolchinsky and so forth. Um, I made, even though, you know, I should have left behind the fact that I came from a long line of steel workers. Like I never got either, either never got good advice or never followed it. Mm -hmm. Probably I got some good advice in there. What kind of an example it. of like, like advice you didn't follow? Post, well, so just to set the stage mm -hmm. for the non-experts. So I graduated with my PhD in 1993. Mm -hmm. So if you're on the cosmology side of things, that's right after we discovered the CMB and I saw it right? If you're on the particle physics side of things or the particle theory side of things, that was just before we found dualities in uh, supersymmetry and string theory. So gearing up to develop the SSC. That's right. But the point is, when I was in grad school, nothing interesting was happening. Right. In my field, <laughs> it was the right? desert. Right. So I was a hot property in the job market just on the basis of promise. Right. Three years later, when I was on the job market again, millions of interesting things were happening, and I wasn't doing any of them. So I was not a hot property in the job market anymore because people were either doing CMB or supersymmetric you know, D brains and things like that, string theory. Um, and no one, you know, like no, no one explained to me that I couldn't just putter around doing whatever I wanted to do, even though no one else cared about it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I made a huge mistake. Even when I moved to Santa Barbara for my second postdoc, I never wrote any papers with any of the faculty at mm -hmm. Santa Barbara, which was just dumb. Like from the network. Connectivity, and just like learning and learning new physics, mm -hmm. right? Like I knew my little area of physics, but there's there so much expertise and brilliance there. And right. I was like, I'm doing my thing, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the universe saved me mm -hmm. um, because I was like, you know, by that point, I was like, you know, if I want to get a job as a physicist, I need to be the expert in something other people care about, right? Um, but what am, what am I an expert in? You know, not that many things. There was one thing I was an expert in that no one cared about, namely the accelerating universe, <laughs> because they hadn't discovered it yet. But then in 1998, they discovered the accelerating universe. I had written a theory paper on models of dark energy. I had written this well-known review article on the cosmological constant. I was best friends with people in both groups, um, you know, Brian Schmidt, Adam Reese, Saul Perlmutter. I, uh, I was... I was someone who advised, I was mentioning the acknowledgments of the very first paper Saul wrote on supernova with Ariel Lubar. Uh, and I collaborated with Brian Schmidt and Adam Reese and, and the group on the first paper on the equation of state. Mm -hmm. So suddenly, even though I didn't do anything, right. I was a hot property job market again, right? <laughs> like the universe changed. So that right. what I did was interesting. I mean, it didn't turn out you were a professor in Chicago, right? You were, you know, no, I got that professorship because the universe started accelerating. Mm. So that was oh, discovered okay, in 1998. I was hired in 1999. Okay. I was suddenly okay. Okay. Now, now it came. <laughs> yeah. It came. Uh, finally, they said the yeah. they said the acceleration of the universe isn't good for anything. But at least in that case, it go. turned out to do useful work mm -hmm. to get you full employment. Um, so I want to turn back a little bit to the book. As I said, I don't want to steal too much thunder from something deeply hidden. Uh, one there of the book published. Uh, September 10th of, of uh, this past year, and it's a great Christmas present. It's been up for it is. many awards, including Amazon's Best Science Book of the Year, yeah. and many other awards, uh, blurbs on the back from the most eminent folks in, uh, in, in the fields of philosophy, physics, mathematics, astronomy, etc. So pick up your copies, plural. And, and speaking of, of you know, contributions to GDP, you know, some people estimate that quantum mechanics contributes 30 to 40 percent of world GDP, if you consider all things like computers, the internet. Um, as I said before, as we both, you know, kind of maybe hinted at, Feynman said it, or Gross said it. Does does you know, does quantum mechanics need us to understand it? And in what place do the foundations of quantum mechanics um, are are they important, or is it just to kind of establish your bona fides? You're a true, you know, physicist used to be called natural philosophers, and You've spoken about this in the past to the extent that physicists will utter the word philosopher. It's in utter disgust and derision. So how do we um, how do we uh, handle that? Yeah, I think that you know um, you don't need to care right about the foundations of quantum mechanics. 
It's like if you want to calculate the scattering cross section of electron positron pairs, or if you want to build a better superconductor or whatever, you don't need to care about the foundations of quantum mechanics. <laughs> the only reason you need to care is if you care how nature works, if yes. you're curious about it, right? Um, personally, I am curious about how nature works. Like when I'm not thinking about quantum mechanics, I'm thinking about what happened at the Big Bang, which is also not going to build a better smartphone or anything like that, right? But it is, you know, there's a tiny fraction of us that have this enormous privilege that we're paid to think about the deepest mysteries of the universe. And philosophers are among them, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's not a bright line in between physics and philosophy. Yeah. There's a there's a strong overlap, a continuum between them. And well, I'm gonna I'm willing to take help wherever I can get, whether it's from physicists or mathematicians or philosophers or uh, mm -hmm. whatever, to try to understand the universe better. <clears throat> so um, another uh, another interesting aspect of the book is that you talk a lot about the reality of the Everettian interpretation of many worlds and splitting the wave function. So maybe for the non-experts, if you could just delve a little bit into what does it mean to split the wave function? What are many worlds? Even though it is not, I would say it's not the you know the core aspect of the book, and, and that I mean it's an important uh, part of it. It takes up most of the first two sections, uh, but still, it's not the ultimate conclusion. I think I think a lot of the conclusion depends on that, obviously. But but can you first say a few words about what is what are many worlds? What is a many worlds interpretation? And maybe explain what is an interpretation? Yeah, it so it's not an interpretation, yeah. by the way. I mean, okay. It's been called that. Everyone right. calls it that. Yeah. I call it it's that. It's a short hammer. It's a theory. Mm -hmm. Like what we're dealing with now. Like maybe back in the 1960s, we were debating different interpretations of quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. But as I say in the book, like it's not debating interpretations of war and peace or doubleness, right? It's it's a different scientific theories with different variables, different experimental predictions in many cases. Mm -hmm. And many worlds is one of these theories. And the idea is simply every version of quantum mechanics says an electron can be in a superposition of spin up and spin down, right? And when it's when you measure it, it's either spin up or spin down. But when you're not measuring it, it's both. It's really it can be a combination of both. And Everett, Hugh Everett, was a grad student in the 1950s who invented this theory, he said, well, look, you are made of electrons and also protons, neutrons, but you are made of particles which you certainly believe obey the rules of quantum mechanics. And as we started the podcast with, everything should obey the rules of quantum mechanics, so you should obey the rules of quantum mechanics. So let's not do the Copenhagen thing, which is treat you as classical and imagine that you look at the electron. Let's treat you as quantum mechanical also. So that's the sort of move that he makes, which if it didn't lead down a certain road, everyone would be happy with, right? But and, and Wheeler did approach that question even before Everett, isn't it? If I recall correctly, I mean, he was in the wave function of the universe. Um, Everett Everett's thesis topic was quantized gravity, gravity. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but he realized, you know, that no one stands outside the universe <laughs> to observe it, so I need to do a little bit better. Mm -hmm. But anyway, he said, look, if, if you obey the rules of quantum mechanics, then you can be in a superposition. So let's ask what the Schrodinger equation, the fundamental dynamical equation of quantum mechanics, let's ask what it predicts when you measure this electron. And again, everyone agrees on the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. The system, U plus electron, evolves into a superposition of the electron will spin up and you saw it spin up, plus the electron will spin down and you saw it spin down. And Everett's brilliant second move was to say, and that's okay. <laughs> it's more therapeutic than, you know, physicists. He's like, just believe that. Don't bend over backwards to deny the reality. This is what the equation says. What if that were just true? Mm -hmm. And he argues if it were just true, we would interpret that as two separate worlds. Because what happens in that one part of the wave function and the other part, once they're created, they have nothing to do with each other. Nothing that happens in one part of the wave function ever affects the other part. So it's as if they are completely different copies of reality. So the point of many worlds is that he never put in a bunch of worlds. The worlds were always there. All he did was say, let's accept that the worlds are there, ask whether or not the people living in those worlds would see the kind of world we see, the kind of events we see. And he says, yes. That's, to be fair, that is an interpretation. I mean, that's sort of an interpretation, right? I mean, you're saying, let's assume it's, it's okay, sort of giving you know, the imprimatur that it's okay to, to treat them for the purposes of this exercise, right? For now, we have not actually come up with a, with a you know, to this point in this particular question. We have not come out with something specific that is an experimental test of many worlds or something that you would observe differently were many worlds to be accurate description of reality. Well, it, it's a theory because it's a set of mathematical structures that evolves in a certain way. Mm -hmm. Now, 
that's just like classical mechanics or general relativity or whatever. And of course, you have to point to things in the world and say, this is what is being represented by that mathematical structure. You have to do that in any theory. And Everett has a way of doing that that is more problematic than classical mechanics, where everything is pretty straightforward. So that's fine, and we can argue about that. But it's eminently falsifiable, because all Everett says is there are wave functions, and they obey the Schrodinger. All you need to show me is a wave function, either either a wave function not obeying the short derivation, mm-hmm. or something in the world that is not a wave function. If you do either one of those things, you have falsified many worlds' interpretation. But won't those apply to the Copenhagen interpretation too? Which says Who knows what the Copenhagen interpretation is? <laughs> I mean, Copenhagen <laughs> I mean, certainly that. says mm-hmm. that of, that. Quantum systems do not obey the Schrodinger equation when right. the wave function is right. mm-hmm. Sure. Right. And Everett says they always. Smooth and uniform yeah. behavior and then collapse in this finite right. sort of event. Um, right. Okay. So for somebody that did want to, you know, as you talk about in the book, in a very uh, cute conversation between the daughter physicist and the father philosopher, maybe a father, oh, right. yeah. Okay. Um, uh, she talks to her father and says, you know, imagine you're a billionaire, billionaire llama. And I, I'm interested in both because, you know, what my experiment right now, the Simons Observatory is in Chile. Uh-huh. There's no shortage of llamas uh, that we could eventually obtain. And uh, there's a shortage of billionaires. Right. So I mean, maybe one of these llamas wants to know. <laughs> so, so you're a billionaire llama. And I want to know, how would you go about actually creating a test that you could endow, you know, the Carroll Institute for, of Technology or the Simons Observatory? You know, we're taking, we're accepting donations this yeah. season. Um, what kind of experiment? Could you do with unlimited resources? People are doing it. It's not a thought experiment. People are doing this experiment. Get a bunch of atoms together, get them, cool them down so it's like a boson sign condensate or so forth. There are theories in which, very explicitly, the weight function undergoes spontaneous collapse without anyone looking at it, okay, without the Schrodinger. So it's an it's a explicit violation of the Schrodinger equation. And you can calculate that that basically dumps energy into the system. So it will ruin the Bose-Einstein of it, right? The, the, the fact that it's a, uh, a coherent condensate, right? So it's very rare for any one particle to undergo one of these transitions, but if you get enough particles together, it will, it will eventually happen. So like the rate per particle is something like once per 300 million years. So you need a bunch of particles. Uh, so it's not an easy experiment to do, yeah. but it's a very clear signal that would rule out many worlds. How, how close would you say we are to that type of and it, and it does. I want to take one other step back. <clears throat> uh, previously, you've, you, you and I have spoken about Karl Popper and the things demarcation, uh, you know, uh, supposition that that you know Popper suggested that something is not scientific if it cannot be falsified. And, and you and I have talked about this and his original targets, and, and you discuss a little bit in the book as well. You know, were things like uh, Marxist dialectic materialism, and yeah. I always point out there's a lot more Marxist dictatorships on Earth today than. In Popper's time, so yeah. even he's been falsified. But uh, physicists take that as sort of a sacrosanct, you know, law of nature. I, I personally think that that owes to a deep sort of um, envy, a philosophical envy of the Girdle's incompleteness, uh, you know, theorem in mathematics, which says that you can't make sure that a formal system of mathematics is, is self-consistent. And so to get, to obtain a parallel structure in physics, we kind of rely on this Popper's definition. And it leads people to say some pretty hostile things, but but uh, but to say things about like the multiverse and even even many worlds uh, that it is not uh, it's not scientific because it, it cannot be falsified. Now you're talking about a falsification, and you know, due respect to my experimental colleagues who make Bose Einstein comets, it's all over San Diego. Um, you know, my laboratory is not the coldest part of San Diego; it's pretty close, but <laughs> six millikelvin yeah. uh, currently. But uh, but they can get a lot colder. So why have uh, to our uh, when will this occur? I mean, we've had both Einstein conferences for 30 years you now, 40 years or more. Um, so what, what are, what are the, some of the practical impediments behind this? Is it a matter of time? I mean, are there things that come into you know, the wave function splitting, the time scales for that? You mentioned 300 million years. What, what kinds of things could we do to, to accelerate the discovery pace? Yeah, so let me just mention, parenthetically, we already agreed that listening to physicists expound about politics shouldn't give them any more credit than a person on the street. Likewise for philosophers, right? Like, no, was a like, no, I mean, likewise for physicists expounding about philosophy. Uh-huh. Like, oh. physicists love to think that with 15 minutes of thought, they can solve all the philosophy problems in the world. Right. That's not true. So when you believe, when you listen to physicists or other scientists talk about the scientific method or what is or is not science, just, you know, kind of, it's a free country. They can go ahead and do that, but they have no expertise whatsoever. No. 
Uh, and but yeah, but even if you take Hopper at face value, it many worlds is perfectly falsifiable for exactly these reasons. And Popper said good things about many worlds. And I had to put no, he didn't agree with it. He didn't mm-hmm. like it, right? He said it was much better than Copenhagen because it was a monstrosity. He also right? liked the steady state universe. I mean, it was, uh, yeah, he had his own uh, weird uh, yeah. uh, interpretation. He wasn't a physicist, not that that prevents him. Not a physicist, right. Um, but, you know, he thought that many worlds is fine you know, in terms of philosophy, and it is very falsifiable. Now, I this example of getting both Einstein condensate and looking for spontaneous collapses is an unusual one just because it's so good. It's like so crystal clear. If you found this, it would be ruled out. Um, there are other alternatives to many worlds, such as Bohmian mechanics, which is much harder to see how to rule them out. In fact, there's plenty of people who believe that they cannot be ruled out. They're experimentally indistinguishable from many worlds. Um, I'm not so sure about that. Like, I think that this is this is part of the uh, ramifications of the fact that we haven't taken the foundations of quantum mechanics seriously, so people haven't really thought as hard as they can about these questions. It's interesting to see now at colleagues at UC San Diego and uh, Dr. Andrew Friedman and uh, Dan Kaiser and Owen Booth that are working with me and others on on so-called uh, quant- a cosmic bell yeah. tests, and and some of these have you know really ruled out as many loopholes or the phase space of available loopholes that could plausibly explain these invariables. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, it does seem there is a resurgence, and they're not the only one. Chinese uh, yeah. groups are very, uh, the National Academy, are very interested in this type of work, quantum information. Uh, maybe we're at the, you know, precipice of a revolution when these types of experiments will be taken, you know, with the, with the seriousness that perhaps they deserve. Um, so I think it is interesting to note that this is something that is uh, potentially falsifiable. And it sounds like you're willing to grant falsifiability as having some measure or, uh, you know, contributing to a metric of success of a theory, maybe not the definitive one as Popper might have argued. Well, I think it's sufficient but not necessary. Right. Okay. You know, if, if you can say that it's falsified, right. falsifiable, then what's your complaint, mm-hmm. right? I mean, here's how to falsify it. Right. You know, one thing I took away from the big picture, your previous book, um, you know, is sort of this, this um, contention that the only that which can interact with the core theory and uh, is, is real or can be considered real. So therefore, you know, poltergeist, and astrology, and maybe even God and, and things like that, that cannot be, you know, there's no God particle, despite Liam Letterman's you know, terminology for it. So a lot of books with that terminology. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I don't blame him. Yeah, he's like, got to gotta move your books. Yep. Um, but the question of, you know, whether or not uh, these, these many worlds, I mean, it, it, is there an interaction with them with the core theory? I mean, can you overlay the superstructure of, of many worlds itself and ask, does it interact with the core theory? Or can it interact? So you might want to explain, what is the core theory? Frank Wilczek's you know, definition for, for what, if you, if you uh, explain what that is. Right? Yeah, and so, well, just to answer the question, of course, they do interact. I mean, they split. Mm-hmm. They came from the same place, right? Mm-hmm. We shared the same past. The world came from the same place. There's a very physical, tangible interaction between them in the past, mm-hmm. just not in the future, right? So the core theory is this way of thinking about the laws of physics that govern our everyday lives. Mm -hmm. And that's a very expansive definition of our everyday lives to basically include almost every experiment ever done here on Earth, right? Mm -hmm. So the idea that the world is a bundle of quantum fields, describing electrons and quarks and neutrinos and so forth, interacting through the rules of quantum field theory and the forces of nature, electromagnetism, the strong force, and even gravity at the quantum level is included here. Because as long as you're within a weak field, weak gravitational field, far away from black holes or the Big Bang or whatever, we understand quantum gravity. So literally everything you've ever seen with your eyes, touched with your fingers, etc., is well defined, well described by this core theory. And people continually misunderstand what I say, and I don't think you do, but other people do, so I'll say it out loud. Like they think what I'm saying is that this existence of this core theory either you know proves that God doesn't exist or proves that life after death doesn't exist or proves that telepathy doesn't exist, but none of that is right. What it proves is that if you want to believe in any of these things that, that somehow affect the world in a way that would show up in your everyday life, then you're saying that this core theory, which I give the equation for in the end yes. of the book, you can buy a t-shirt with the equation on it, you're saying that's wrong. Right. You're saying it has to be modified in some way. It's insufficient. So, it, so this theory has been tested six ways from Sunday. So if you're going to say it's wrong, fine. 
tell me how it's wrong. Tell me exactly where it goes wrong. Forget about God and all that stuff. If you think that consciousness is something other than a manifestation of physical stuff, tell me where this equation goes wrong. That's your burden because right. we've established the equation is pretty good. And could one not say, well, in the future, we, and just we didn't know that the weak force and you know, the core theory of 1929 is very different than the core theory of 1939, etc. So are you just thinking historically? Could one say, well, we don't know how the soul part, you know, the solon or whatever, the crouton interacts with the core theory now, but you're shortchanging experimentalists of the future. Could one not say that? And one cannot say that. That's the thing, because the wonderful, it's a special feature of quantum field. Um, there's, there's different ways of talking about it, but in the book I explain this idea of crossing symmetry, that if something can affect an electron in some way, then you can rotate by 90 degrees, and you can make that thing by smashing electrons together, right? Fields that talk to each other and have an influence on each other can be created or destroyed by each other. So if there were things that affected the quantum fields of the core theory, we could make them. They either are just not there, or they interact so weakly they have zero on our everyday life. And no discoveries in future physics will change that, unless those discoveries say quantum field theory is entirely wrong. But what about in the other direction? So obviously the soul is something human-centered, how it would have to be a low-energy phenomenon. What about those who say, well, we haven't reached high enough energy. You know, when you reach you know, 10 to the 16 GeV, you know, looking at the early quantum universe, perhaps, today you might see evidence of some particles. What about the other end? But that's not our everyday life. Yeah, so outside our everyday life, in the very, very early universe, of course, the core theory is nowhere near sufficient. And in one of your talks, I think it was at Oxford, on the philosophy mm -hmm. of theology, you, you have a, a talk called God is not a good theory. Right. Uh, not God is not a theory, but God is yeah. not a good theory. Uh, <laughs> they misprinted the title, actually. Yeah. So I'm joking about that. <laughs> and in the talk, you talk, yeah, right, that's true. And in that talk, you, you, you give a few different arguments. And, and one of them, which, which I took issue with, um, was the, the, the notion of, you know, you show the Hubble DC. You say, yeah, what's the point of all these galaxies if there is a creator? So I wonder if you can maybe re recapitulate that, that argument. But you know, I could say, well, there's 116 elements on the periodic table, you know, and maybe God's advocate in this case would say, well, what is the purpose of any of those? You know, why do we need them? We're only made of, you know, maybe three dozen different elements in the body. So aren't you being too, you know, anthropocentric? When you talk about what's the purpose of these galaxies, oh, who knows? I mean, what, what is so uh, as a, as an argument against the existence of God as a good theory, not not existence of God itself, but why why is that uh, sort of a, a persuasive argument in your opinion? That well, because good theories make good predictions, and I, we're thinking about this as good bases. Okay, so we have different theories of the universe: and the theistic models, atheistic models, whatever, and then little subcategories within there. And then you ask yourself, the whole job of testing theories is you say, if this theory were true, what should I observe? And then you update. You have a prior probability for all of your theories, and you update that, to say, depending on the likelihood of would you have observed that. So if all you knew was that God created the universe, and, and God loves us, and God has some special place for us in his heart, uh, what do you predict should be the large scale? features of the universe. Well, we've done that experiment because there were people thousands of years ago who had this belief, and none of them predicted 200 billion galaxies spread uniformly throughout the world with no human beings on them, right? It was completely irrelevant to us. If all you needed was to make humankind, there's much easier ways to do that than sure, to create right. these right. universes. So either, let me just finish, so either you, you say, well, I have no idea what God predicts, or you say, well, God wouldn't have predicted that, therefore I lower the probability. And if you say, I have no idea what God predicts, you're saying God's not a good theory. Right. Okay. Yeah. So I would say just the same. It might be to paraphrase what you're saying. The, the existence of the extra 108 elements or whatever on the PR table is further justification in a non, maybe perhaps parsimonious God. But, you know, to, I mean, to use a, a trivial case, I have, you know, eight colleagues in San Diego who study the Hubble Deep Field, who study every one of those galaxies. And, you know, it might be, uh, yeah, God's advocate, the purpose of those galaxies, you know, is for human curiosity to understand the universe. Uh, again, I think when you overlay on top of it the, the notion that, you know, these attributes of God, that, that's, that's another thing. Um, but, you know, perhaps it's, uh, again, just, just speaking, trying to summarize, 
the you know this the excess of these of these elements and and things that we can't interact with or see no purpose for um you know it's it's not clear to me that that sub that that in, entirely invalidates the notion of even a personal god but certainly taking away the personal aspect of the god entirely a god a creator that created the universe perhaps i don't know that that necessarily invalidates it, right because it's just a trivial example yeah, i want to say come on <laughs> i mean of course you could after the fact invent some ex post facto justification for, oh god would have wanted right. to do so exactly that, that. Yeah. and this is the entire history of theology mm-hmm. discovering new theory, new facts about the universe and go that's just how god would have wanted to do it and never right. did they say ahead of time god will want it to be this way and this way we're going to predict it that's why it's a crappy theory Okay, good. So um, I want to conclude in the last few minutes with uh, with the plug zone. I want to go and I refer people, plug, and I will. Yeah, yeah, I'll put a bunch of links to that talk uh, that we just mentioned. I want to talk uh, put links to the book uh, and the other things that are coming up in uh, Sean Carroll's universe that we'd like the audience. To know. Uh, no, I mean <laughs> subscribe to the podcast, but you know it's the usual thing. We're after Mindscape the book podcast. comes out, Mindscape podcast. Um, after a book comes out, then it's back to science for me. So, like, I, I, I'm, I'm feeling very chagrined because this is a very low publication uh, year for me because I got the book out and everything. And I have like chat. three or four publications for, for that are within Epsilon. Number being written. Ten, not ten bestseller. <laughs> Another one. <laughs> but I want to write. The, I want to get these papers done. So, you know, if there are any businesses out there, yeah, by all means, look for papers. I have papers yes. coming out on quantum mechanics, cosmology, and a. a one that I'm really very excited about, about statistical mechanics and causality, why the past and why you cause have causal influence over the future, but not the past, right? Mm-hmm. Relating to sort of J.F. Pearl's uh, ideas about causality and things like that. So it's something that people have mumbled about, but I think we can make it a bit more rigorous. Okay, last question. Dream guest for the podcast. Alive? People who are uh, alive today? Do yes. I get to like ask you can't, Galileo? You can't violate um, the core theory, Sean. All right. Uh, <laughs> people who are alive. Um, you know, I... I, I've been asked this before, and I've never given a satisfactory answer. And part of it is I've done pretty well yeah. with, with getting my dream guests, and I have a few more coming up yeah. who, are, uh, who are pretty good. You know, um, um, I and mean, I have a long list of people who I have not invited, but if I did invite them, they might say yes. So, uh, you know, I'd love to have Martha Nussbaum on the podcast. I'd love to have Barack Obama on the podcast. Mm-hmm. Actually, I have a rule against current politicians or candidates because I think that they uh, have a vested interest in trying to get elected, not telling the truth, right? (laughs) And Obama probably also has that even though he's out of office, so he probably wouldn't count either. But um, he'll have you on his Netflix special. And all these people, you know, recently (laughs) passed away. I mean, Noam Chomsky would be the guy to have on the podcast. Um, uh, Yeah. David Deutsch. One with Jennifer. David Deutsch, I do want to have. Thought of one with Jennifer. Jennifer doesn't want to do it. She, she, want to. she likes writing. She just wants to stay, you know, she's the equivalent of a physicist. She wants to stay. She wants to be a, a We liar. had her down for a Math for America speech. You can, you can uh, coax her into doing it, but she's okay. much happier at home with the cats writing. That's All right. That's great. great. Let me show you the book one more time out right. there in Hilbert Space. Uh, Hilbert Space real or not? Totally real. Okay. Well, the universe is real and it's element of it. <laughs> Get the book. Audio, visual, Kindle, any form possible. Something deeply hidden by Dr. Sean Carroll, physicist at California Institute of Technology. Thank you, Sean. All right. Thanks, Brian. The only thing we can be sure of about the future is that it will be absolutely fantastic. Five, four, three, two, one.